going to be seeing today a movie that will tell you much about the house, but I want to supplement the movie with some other information and another perspective. Uh, and the perspective is that of a guinea pig, because this was an experiment not only architecturally but socially, because it was a live workspace in which, uh, as a child, uh, I grew up in a place where there were architects working, clients visiting, uh, apprentices living in the house, and people always knocking on the door wanting to come in and uh, tour the house. About this age, it was my task to, every morning, take a glass of hot milk and walk through this patio to the office where my father had been working since four o'clock in the morning and was sitting on a high metal stool uh, uh, doing preliminary drawings for the people who would be coming in at eight o'clock. So I knew what my father did, uh, where he did it, who he did it with, and who he did it for, which is kind of unusual for most children. Uh, and as I grew older, I was involved in helping my father lay out uh, books that he published, or uh, here I am, sorry, moving out of the light, uh, uh, playing guitar at an office party. Um, and then, as a child, I was brought along with Julius Schulman, uh, who would be taking pictures of my father's houses. And in this case, I was posed there in front of the house with my dog, Arrow. Uh, but my job was to push the client's furniture out of the picture and put some uh, crucial Neutra furniture in place. Um, growing up in this place, uh, there were a number of things that I picked up that ultimately led to the career that I had as a physician and then as a epidemiologist uh, doing research on the environment. And some of those learnings were that environmental decisions impact health, that biology and sociology uh, can help uh, decisions, that everyone has a right to be healthy, that cost effectiveness provides uh, care for all because you make it possible for services or housing or schools to be available. Uh, one should study what works and what, one, what doesn't work and uh, make steady improvement. One needs to respect one's clients and stakeholders in the work that you're doing. It takes all sorts to make a team and it takes skill to lead a team. All of those things were things that I saw growing up and were relevant to my career in public health. Uh, and in fact, there I am holding my face there at a World Health Organization conference on housing and health when my hair was a little less gray than it is now. Um, so what, where, and when, it's a triplex residence, an architectural studio, 20 by 23 meters in the Silver Lake District of Los Angeles built in three stages, 1932, 1940, and 1966. And uh, the 1932 version was a duplex in studio with a roof garden, overhangs, awnings, and this loan from the Dutch philanthropist van der Leo. And today, this is a, this is a model, and by the way, uh, if those of you who have iPads, you can go to your app store and put in Neutra, hyphen VDL and download uh, a very extensive uh, description of this in which this model is there. So you can see that at the top of the picture, uh, there is a wing, uh, a multi-story wing, and then there are two small patios, and at the bottom of the picture is the 1940 garden house wing. And this is another uh, view um, of the model. Uh, so it is a true compound in that these two uh, uh, wings, you cannot go from one to the other inside, you have to pass the, through the patios. Uh, after the loan, my mother wrote an ecstatic letter to her mother in Switzerland saying that this is quite a miracle that Van der Leo has given us this money because now we're going to be able to uh, afford to demonstrate uh, how one can live and that it will not be hospital-like 
uh, and it will be comfortable in that you can show with inexpensive materials and products you can assemble uh, a house. So then the question is why would VDL loan what amounted to half the median price of an American home at that time to my father. He originally offered to give it as a gift and then as a interest-free loan and my father said, no, I can't do that, but I can take an, a wonderful interest loan because no bank would give me any loan to build the kind of place that I want to do. Uh, so. To understand the chemistry between these two people of very different backgrounds, Thunder Leo came from an aristocratic uh, old uh, uh, family in uh, uh, business family from uh, Rotterdam, and my father uh, came from a Jewish um, uh, Hungarian family that had only a generation before migrated to, the United, uh, to, to Vienna. And there they are, indeed, uh, you see my grandfather with a beard and my father with a bald head looking very grumpy. Um, he, he, must, he must, being a physician, my guess is that he must have had lice and they had to shave his head. Uh, uh, his father, uh, his grandfather was a physician and was a public health physician like I am. Uh, practicing on the far reaches of the Hungarian uh, countryside near Romania and there was a typhoid epidemic that killed him and his wife and so my grandfather was orphaned at the age of nine and came from rural Hungary to Vienna where he was apprenticed with a bell maker making cowbells and ultimately he became a machinist and had a small firm with about 20 employees where he made gas meters and so forth but he knew what it meant to be a blue collar worker. He was a member of the Social Democrat Party in Vienna and uh, he managed to send all of his children to university. So Uncle Wilhelm there with the glasses was a psychiatrist. Uncle Siegfried who must have taken this picture was a patent attorney and an engineer. Uh, Aunt Josephine, who's there at the end, was a uh, artist and married one of the curators of the Habsburg Crown Jewels. Uh, so my father was the youngest, as you can see by far, and interestingly, I'm the youngest in my family, so that my father uh, could have almost been my grandfather, and those, uh, those older brothers heard Brahms conduct the um, Vienna Symphony Orchestra, and my father heard Mahler conduct. So um, uh, it's a, I have kind of a personal link that goes back a little bit further than most people do. So my father grew up in Imperial Vienna. Uh, Kaiser Wilhelm uh, was, died when my father was in the Austrian army in 1913. And you can't imagine a culture more different than Los Angeles, California than Imperial Vienna. Uh, his influences, of course, were Otto Wagner, whose, whose wonderful uh, um, subway stations he admired. Uh, and, of course, Wagner had written Moderne Architektur and the idea that architecture should not be about styles but about systems thinking and new technology. And, and in fact, he was enthusiastic about Wright's work when he saw it. And his other influence was Adolf Loos, in whose atelier he worked after school. Uh, uh, Loos, who had written that uh, ornament was a crime, um, that uh, client-centered uh, craft of architecture, arch that the only art that architects did were tombstones, but the rest of the time that they had to be responsible to the client. They, these were things that sunk in very much uh, to my father, and I believe that Le Corbusier republished that Loos art, uh, article in, in his uh, magazine uh, um, in the early 20s. Uh, but the architecture that my father uh, learned was very much in the tradition of uh, Europe, in which the indoors is indoors and the outdoors is outdoors. And it was only, and you can see this even in the 1912 Otto Wagner uh, Villa, which uh, looks kind of modern in a way, but certainly 
uh, does, uh, keeps the outside out and the inside in. But people were starting to see images like this from, uh, from Japan. This is the 1640 um, uh, Shizendo in, in, in Kyoto. And, uh, and then, of course, came the Vasmuth portfolio, which you see me holding there at the Getty Museum, where you have to have special permission to touch it. Uh, and these were the kind of illustrations that my father and other architects saw with a very different relationship of indoors and outdoors and an explosion of the box and so forth. Uh, my father commented it was like looking at people from another planet must live in such places. Uh, and he then discovered in the um, uh, um, final exhibition of students in the adjacent architecture school, this work of Rudolf Schindler, and they became friends. Uh, this was the kind of thing that the Wagner Schule was doing in 1913. Uh, and of course, his friend Schindler then designed this building in Los Angeles in 1921. When my father joined Schindler, he was already working on this book describing what Americans do. And he came to America partly to work with Wright, which he did do, uh, but also because he, hearing from Los, uh, had the idea that if Henry Ford could assemble different parts in an efficient way so that everybody could afford an automobile. Why could you not do the same thing with uh, housing, schools, uh, medical clinics, hospitals, and so forth? And then by making them uh, inexpensive, everybody would be able to have the benefit of this. And so uh, what Americans took for granted, which was the Sweets catalog, was a romantic excitement for him, which uh, the Europeans shared, and the Japanese shared, and the Russians actually translated this into Russian. Um, and van der Leo had read this, uh, read this book about American technology and a new vision of a architecture of assemblage. Um, um, and it, in this, he described a ring plan school that would be prefabricated with, with the classrooms, with sliding doors that would open into gardens with uh, bilateral light and, uh, and so forth. It was really only at the end of his career that he was able to build one of these schools, which is still in operation. It's called the Richard Neutra School. Uh, and then in 1929, he had a client who was a naturopath who wanted to build a house which had all kinds of special health characteristics, that there would be special glass to let in enough UV light so that you would get vitamin D <coughs> formed in your skin, that uh, there would be a special kitchen to prepare vegetarian meals, a swimming pool without chlorine, uh, exercise places, and, and uh, so it was called the health house. And it was also off the shelf with uh, this uh, uh, metal frame that was assembled in 48 hours, uh, all the way to Model A lights that were installed in the light well. Uh, and then he had an idea about beauty that many in the Germanic languages had, which was that beautiful things had been the domain of very wealthy people and were, were tools of a conspicuous consumption and status, is there a way that you could have a relationship with beautiful things that were made in factories, uh, whose precision was made by machines and not by special royal craftsmen, uh, that uh, was an authentic kind of relationship with beauty. So if you look at his writings from the 1920s on, you see that he is fascinated by phenomenology of architecture and the physiological experience. So this wine bottle, we buy the wine not for how it looks, but the physiological effect that it has on us, our olfactory glands, the happiness that we get from a nice glass of wine. And then he was focusing on the performance of architecture. So we have this uh, uh, corkscrew here that uh, uh, we expect to perform. In the case of a house, it's what 
accommodating what we do there, accommodating how we as human beings interact there. Um, and then this commitment that like Henry Ford, somehow you'd be able to do this in a way that uh, some basic uh, beauty and functionality would be available to everybody in this architecture of social concern. Uh, and so here is a Mac uh, computer uh, which uh, designed by a whole team of industrial designers with those kinds of goals in mind and following what Charles Eames said, which was avoid compromise but embrace constraints. Now, why would van der Leo be attracted to those kinds of things? Uh, there was a right influence in Holland, as you know, because Berlage and others had traveled to America and gotten wind of the prairie style, and Berlage lectured and also wrote a book about it. Van Hoft actually visited with Wright and designed this Wrightian-like uh, concrete building uh, in 1919, I think it was. Uh, and van der Leo had been the client for the Theosophical Temple that was designed first by, um, um, I'm blocking on his name, but finally finished by Brinkman and van der Vroep. And uh, you can see the Wrightian influence there. We're almost like at the um, Guggenheim here. Um, and then, of course, in his own house in 1928, uh, again, a wonderful uh, indoor-outdoor uh, experience uh, with wonderful uh, industrial materials. And uh, so in 1930, when my father came to Europe, uh, van der Leo got wind of the fact that the guy who had written that book and who had designed the health house was now in Europe and was coming to the SIAM meeting. And he asked von Eastern where he was and found out and, and sent a telegram saying, can you meet with me? I'd like to meet you. And my father thought he was a Dutch uh, uh, journalist, not knowing who van der Leo was, and came down uh, to the appointed place and found a very handsome man, which, whose picture we saw in a Packard limousine with a, a chauffeur, and a lady from the Russell Sage Foundation. They were on their way to uh, go to Geneva for the first meeting of the uh, International Organization for Industrial Relations that van der Leo had founded. And van der Leo invited him to uh, uh, Holland to lecture, to stay at this house. He stayed at Rietveld's house here in Utrecht. He went to uh, Zonestral. He saw the uh, open air school with Döker and um, um, was very impressed by all of that and then went on to the SIAM meeting in Brussels. Uh, and then, uh, so that there was that architectural uh, um, common heritage, uh, but, and, and here um, is uh, <laughs> Vessel showing me the uh, wonderful restored uh, Fanella factory where van der Leo had traveled all over the world uh, to uh, study other factories, industrial psychology, uh, and so forth to uh, uh, do this, uh, design this building. So that what are the shared pa passions of these two men? That they were fascinated by building types of social concern. They were fascinated by the authentic role of beauty for everybody. They were uh, committed to results-driven design to serve doing, interacting, and experiencing, the usefulness of biological and social sciences, and then the idea that industrial America had the potential to instruct Europe. Uh, van der Leo had borrowed all kinds of features uh, in, in that factory, and it made sense to him that here was this Austrian who was so enthusiastic about what one could do uh, with uh, American technology uh, because that was available there but not here yet. And so I think it may have been those points which, and obviously a kind of personal chemistry as well, which uh, led to the next adventure, which was to send a telegram to my father in 1931 that he was in New York 
coming to LA to give a lecture and could he come and visit? And so my father drove him around in his old Chevrolet, third hand Chevrolet. And when they got to the hotel at the end, Van der Leo said, well, you should build your own house. And my father said, I don't have the money. And Van der Leo pulled out a checkbook and said, how much do you need? So um, that was the beginning of the adventure for this Neutra BDL one house. And I think the causal pathway goes like this, Japan right their Lage uh, to the Dutch with probably Los and some of those instincts also influencing the Dutch. Wright gets to Neutra and Schindler directly and Los gets to them directly. They both work with Los. And van der Leo was a patron for both the Dutch and for my father and through my father he he indirectly was a patron for California Modern. So this is the uh, BDL-1. Uh, it's really, in 1932, you can see this doesn't quite look like the health house. That you have these write-in overhangs, you have soffit strip lighting, you have uh, a, uh, a vertical um, uh, built-in uh, awnings that come down against the sun. Um, you have uh, these screens in the overhang that lets the plenum breathe. And then he seems to have borrowed the Dutch silver paint. I'm on the trail of the Dutch silver paint. Someone told me that it was Rietveld who said it was a dematerializing thing, but the Rietveld scholars deny that. So if anybody knows, tell me. Uh, but after that, he kept using silver paint and kept explaining that it dematerialized. You see the highlight on this pole here. And then the first use of transparent doors, which he liked to do, a not so practical but beautiful thing. When you're in your bathrobe and the postman comes, maybe you don't like it so much. Uh, and here is my father in the living room at night. One of the interesting things of the publication of this house, which I came across in doing some research recently, was a 15-page spread in the Architectural Forum with several full-page nighttime pictures of the house at night but because of the strip lighting, the kind of a transparency. And I tried to think if I'd ever seen a nighttime picture of the Barcelona Pavilion or the Tugentat House or uh, the Savoy um, uh, Villa, and I don't think so. This was, uh, he was fascinated by the way things looked at light. Uh, and here is the 1966 version. Now the detail has become refined, but it's the cell, same idea of shooting the uh, ceiling line out uh, through the glass and uh, opening the house to all the subtle changes that go on. Uh, here's my mother sitting on the balcony of the second floor with the uh, ceiling light, ceiling shooting off out of sight and enlarging the space of this really very small room. The office was there. You don't see pictures of it. The office was actually illegal in this place for 40 years. And my father didn't want people to see that he designed 300 projects out of two rooms. Uh, when the house uh, burned, the top two floors burned down in 1963, it left this bottom level here. And this, this garage door with another door inside it was my room. And when I went off to boarding school, it became a apprentice's room. It had bunk beds, so two people could be there. For example, Eric Schneider Vesseling spent a number of years in that little room. And if you look at the ceiling of the room, you are looking up at prefabricated uh, girders and um, uh, beams that were put into place in one day, and then a special kind of wooden um, uh, frames were locked into this under here, and a reinforced concrete slab was poured on top of that and then those wooden frames were removed without any nails and taken away, and so now you can look up at the underside of that thing, uh, the remnant of the 1932 uh, building and the place where a lot of influential architects uh, lived while they were working with my father. 
When I was born, the uh, garden house wing was built. It was considered innovative, uh, oriented to this inner patio with a sliding metal glass wall that opened, and you can see it here. Um, um, this whole wall slides over here and opens into that uh, a living room which doubled as my parents' uh, bedroom on some occasions. Uh, and at night, you can see the same detail of the strip uh, lighting that was used in the 1932 version. Uh, this idea of opening into the outdoors with bilateral light and so forth influenced the, the 1935 uh, um, Bell Avenue School in Corona. And, um, it became the model for American schools for several generations. And my father then adapted it for use with uh, reinforced concrete. You can see a similarity to Zonestral here. This is 1946, not 1926. Uh, yeah, because uh, they have cement in Puerto Rico and they have earthquakes in Puerto Rico. And those model for those schools were published and had been very influential in South American schools. So, uh, van der Leo's uh, fingers are reaching now to South America in that influence. In 1963, uh, an electrical fire destroyed the top two floors of the VDL-1, and my brother Dion and my father together then designed on the same footprint uh, VDL-2 wing of the house. Um, many of the same design decisions were retained here, uh, but things were added, like these uh, sun louvers, uh, a rooftop pool, and, and so forth. And you'll see all of that in the movie, so I'm not going to go over those details. But Harwell Harris, Gregory Ain, Joseph Allen Stein, and Eric Schneider Vesseling, all heads of architecture departments, started their career in this 60 by 70 foot place. Uh, and uh, through them and my father, there was an influence on the uh, case study uh, uh, program of the late 40s, which basically had this same ideology of an architecture of assembling uh, uh, industrial um, uh, things, either on site or in a factory. Um, then the 1942 uh, Nesbitt House, uh, which signals a, a broadening of the palette of materials that my father was using, was also very influential and arguably was important in the whole movement of California ranch style houses. Uh, here is a Cliff May design where you can see both the right and the Neutra uh, rustic uh, influence. And, and these were widely influential um, in the United States. So um, all of this was enabled by that kindly help of a Dutch uncle. Uh, and again, uh, this causal diagram. So what about the future? Our vision is to restore, maintain, inform, and serve. Back in 2008, things were looking very grim. Uh, the roofs were leaking. You can see what happened to the ceiling there. Uh, there was no way to fund the maintenance, much less the repair. And uh, so uh, a number of us worked together to create the Friends of the Neutra VDL. Uh, Julius Schulman, who, for whom I moved furniture around when I was a kid, uh, was our first honorary member, and uh, he agreed to let the Getty, who owns the rights now to all his photographs, to run off 35 digital archival prints, double size, and then he signed and numbered them and said, sell these to fix that roof. And then uh, Sarah Lawrenson had the brilliant idea of having a course in which the students study the work of my father and, in particular, this place, and prepare a docent tour, and then they have to come out for four weekends to give the tour. Um, 
the university is engaged. Art students make posters about the house. Architecture students come out and do projects there, do drawings, uh, do energy audits of a house for the, uh, of, as a practice. Uh, the music students come out and give uh, uh, musical um, uh, benefit concerts uh, on my mother's piano. Uh, the uh, uh, history students are working with me on making a website on the social history of the house. It turns out my systematic mother, who was a musician, but also my father's executive director, kept a diary of everybody who came to dinner from 1939 to 1963 when the fire occurred. And uh, she recorded who was there, what they talked about, what they ate, and what she sang to them. Uh, and on September 14th, 1941, there was a reception for Fernand Léger to which Isamu Noguchi and Man Ray and the Stravinsky's and Countess Tolstoy, among others, came. And, uh, what they are doing is preparing a website so that if you were to jog by the house, you would see a, a placard with a picture of the house with a question mark and a bar graph, a bar code. And if you took your smartphone and took a picture of the bar code, it would take you to pictures inside the house. And if you clicked on the picture with the piano, then you would get an MP3 of my mother singing a Schubert lead on that piano. There are uh, photo shoots at the house, which bring in uh, money for it. Uh, uh, this is uh, Professor Tom Hines giving a lecture at the pro bono lecture at the house. It's a similar size audience as we have here. Then there are art installations. This uh, Guatemalan Indian is weaving this uh, Santiago Borja installation on the uh, water roof of the house, uh, and you can see it here from across the street. Um, I mentioned the iPad um, uh, which, uh, app which has been developed. Um, the sculptor Xavier Veillon uh, did an installation at the house. He's doing it at various modernist houses. Uh, now pro bono help from the Friends of the Neutra. One of them is here. Um, uh, Leo Marmol, who has restored a number of Neutra houses, has come forth and offered to do the working drawings and prepare uh, for getting permits to do all the uh, roof uh, repairs. Uh, my brother Dion is there consulting, and this is Sarah Lawrenson, the resident director, and now the dean of the architecture school. Um, and um, so various grants. Uh, here's restoration going on. It started to rain this uh, January, so the whole place was tarped as they uh, repaired the roof in the penthouse. And uh, um, various grants. So how can you help? Well, when you go to Los Angeles, visit VDL. Uh, we invite people to do benefit events and to purchase this beautiful Schulman print of my father on the roof that is no longer leaking. <laughs> and there's my mother and father. Thank you.